Uh, which brings us to claim three, the Christmas tree. Claim three states that the evergreen was chosen as Christmas tree due to the mycorrhizal relationship between tree and mushroom. This claim can actually be put to rest rather easily. While it is true that medieval people still made garlands and wreaths out of evergreens as they, as they had done since the pagan days of yore, that certainly hadn't changed, the first Christmas trees actually only date back to the 13th century. And they weren't evergreens in those days, they were deciduous trees. Here is a brief list of the kinds of trees used as a Christmas tree in medieval Europe before the evergreen. Apple, lilac, plum, hazel, linden, yew, and boxwood. Needless to say, the Amanita muscaria does not have a mycorrhizal relationship with any of those trees. The whole point, the whole reason Christians started bringing trees into the home, they didn't do it for Christmas, actually. They did it on September 4th, which is, was, well, still is, but nobody really celebrates it anymore. It was the feast day of St. Barbara. The idea was you were supposed to take a tree indoors and nurse it back to life in time for Christmas. Something that you can't do with an evergreen tree. So it would defeat the whole purpose of this custom to use an evergreen. Now, around the early and mid 1500s in Germany, evergreens would replace the deciduous trees, but that decision had nothing to do with the Amanita muscaria and everything to do with the Protestant Reformation and its stance against saint worship. So St. Barbara's custom, bringing the tree inside and nurturing them, became socially taboo and illegal in some areas. Since evergreens do not have to be nurtured in the winter, there was no saint associated with the practice, making it okay with the Protestants to bring evergreens into the house. So when we consider the cherry, apple, lilac, and the other trees, and the real reason evergreens were eventually chosen, such an arrangement about this mycorrhizal relationship between the evergreen and the mushroom becomes impossible to maintain. Think of all those other trees, the apple, cherry, boxwood, as the 50 other prisoners you didn't realize existed until you took off the blindfold. So this brings us to the custom of hanging uh, Christmas ornaments on trees. The claim is that the tradition of hanging ornaments on trees comes from shamans drying Amanita muscaria mushrooms on tree branches. The custom actually comes from a medieval play called the Mystery of the Paradise Tree, which was celebrated on the feast day of Eve and Adam, December 24th, our modern Christmas Eve. Now, part of the tradition associated with this play involved hanging communion wafers on the branches of the tree just before midnight. I should say real quick, uh, there, you would already have apples hung on the trees. I'm sorry about that. You'd have apples. Those apples represented Adam's sin and the fall of humanity from the Garden of Eden. You would then place the communion wafers on the tree as a way of overcoming this original transgression, it was called the, uh, the radix apostatica, the root of all apostasy, okay? Um, and that's, why, that's literally why we put uh, ornaments on trees to this day. It's to overcome Adam's sin. <laughs> uh, this would perceive, uh, the, the whole point was that you put the, the communion wafers on and it would precede the arrival of Jesus being born on December 25th. Uh, so that's where the custom comes from, a bunch of medieval Christians who had never even heard of the Siberian shop. Uh, I did want to say history aside from and from a purely pragmatic perspective, um, this claim about the hanging mushrooms on the tree branches to dry them is very important as it invites a safety hazard. The Amanita muscaria is rife with what's called ibotenic acid, uh, which will make you nauseous if you eat a, a, a a mushroom that hasn't been dried, okay? So when you dry the mushroom, you de decarboxylate it, that turns the ibotenic acid into entheogenic muscimol, which is the good stuff that you want. 
Uh, you need to do this in a, preferably a dehydrator, but Eden and I have done it in the oven and uh, uh, by a fire as well. Uh, but dehydrator is the best way. Uh, so what I'm getting at is this. Does anyone really believe that it is possible to dry a mushroom outside in the winter in Siberia? It gets really, really, really cold there. And uh, we go mushroom hunting uh, with our, our friend Christopher came with us the last time uh, we went. And uh, they're pretty heavy when they're wet and just hanging them on a tree. You're, they're not going to dry that way. Uh, so if what I'm getting, if this holiday season, if somebody offers you a mushroom uh, to eat during a holiday party that they say has been dried in the ancient way of the shamans, do not eat that mushroom because if you do, you're going to get violently ill and end up in the hospital. So please don't do that. Um, on to our fifth claim, putting presents under the tree. This idea that the custom of placing gifts under trees comes from the symbology of finding Amanita muscaria under ever, evergreen trees and the whole mycorrhizal relationship um, has a lot of issues uh, as well. For starters, we today put presents under the tree, but in the early 1800s, when a lot of these ideas were being formed, that wasn't the case. Even though they take a back seat to the tree today, Christmas stockings were the preferred gift delivery system in the early days of modern Christmas celebrations. Uh, and it goes back to an old um, legend about St. Nick who threw coins through the window of a guy's house who had three daughters that he couldn't afford a dowry for, and some of the change at one of the nights fell into one of the stockings. That's actually where that custom comes from. Uh, anyway, um, um, both poems, uh, both founding poems of these, of these uh, traditions, Old Santa Claus with Much Delight and uh, A Visit from St. Nick, uh, they actually only mention stockings. If you read the poems, they don't say anything about Christmas trees. Now, eventually the stockings fell out of favor and they were replaced with something called a lickstock or a Christmas triangle. We don't really use lickstocks anymore, but if you've been to a holiday party this year or in the past, or you go to one this year and you see one of these, right? This is what the lickstock evolved into. Each one of these tiers that now have these figures on them used to have a little presence on them. Now, when we finally get to having Christmas trees in America, uh, when it, this, this, these, ideas finally, these ideas finally made their, their way over, they were actually hung from the ceilings as we see here and here. Okay. And the presents were placed on a table elsewhere in the room. So even when the tree enters popular culture, the gifts aren't even associated with it. Eventually the tree would be placed on a table and the gifts would be put on the branches, uh, as we see uh, with this uh, illustration from 1845. And I just wanna point out real quick, you'll notice it's still a deciduous tree here. So there's still that custom, we still get echoes of that. And as we can also see, uh, St. Nick, or here was, he's called Chris Kringle. Uh, if anybody wants to know where that came from, that name, uh, I'll get into that in the Q and A. Uh, he's actually hanging the gifts on the branches, not putting them underneath. Placing presents underneath the tree was actually the last idea to develop in popular culture. So <laughs> to recap, first, the presents are placed in stockings. Second, they're placed on a lick stock. Third, they're uh, placed on a table and the tree is hung elsewhere in the room. Fourth, they're hung on tree branches. And fifth, finally, they're placed under the, under the tree. And the only reason we started placing them under the tree had to do with the rise of corporate capitalism in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So in the beginning, Santa Claus brought, or St. Nick, I should say, brought small presents. See, like, you know, they're little candies, nuts, little wooden horses and figurines. They were small. With the rise of corporate capitalism, the presents started to become too big. So you couldn't hang them on the branches of the tree or you'd destroy the tree. So that just made more sense to put them underneath the tree. So just like the red and white of Santa's costume and flying reindeer, if placing presents under the tree really derived from Amanita Muscaria traditions hailing from Siberia, 
such associations would be evident right from the start. Instead, once again, we see a clear, natural unfolding of culture. Again, we see that there were 50 other prisoners. These are the kinds of historical problems we run into when we simply just take various bits of random data from here, there, all over the place, and put it together into a new exciting narrative that never actually existed in history. Watch, I can prove it to you right now. I will prove to you that a visit from St. Nick is really, uh, and Christmas traditions, they're not secretly about the Amanita Muscaria, they're secretly about cocaine use. See, watch, let's go back to Clement Clark Moore's poem, A Visit from St. Nick. And laying his finger aside his nose and giving a nod, because it's really good cocaine, oh, up the chimney he rose, just like the flying reindeer. And anyway, what's with all that snow and staying up all night and looking out your window like a paranoid freak? Clearly, these are all covers for cocaine use. And as we know, Coca-Cola did use to put cocaine in their beverage. There's literally more evidence for a secret cocaine Santa Claus than there is for a secret Amanita Muscaria Santa Claus. And yet nobody believes in the cocaine Santa Claus. 